All right, well, I can't promise that we'll do this every week, but there's enough of this to go around lately that it just seems like, oh, uh, my goodness. So, of course, we mentioned a couple of them last week, Hasbro. And just to clarify, uh, this is why it does make a difference to complain, because Hasbro got the complaint. I don't think their change is great, but, you know, they did add the verbiage, you know, that it's like, no, 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 it's still Mr. Potato Head and Mrs. Potato Head. Okay, fine, whatever. Um, this is a meme that you may or may not have seen or something along those lines. Um, Just saying, be fruitful and multiply. Um, I left my copy of Mein Kampf at home, but I did bring a Dr. Seuss book. You know, the thing about Theodor Geisel is that the guy was super liberal, would have loved socialism just fine, um, and yet he's getting lambasted for these six titles, now it's, the, it's the, his foundation, I mean his family's foundation that has decided to cease publishing these six titles. Now somebody was complaining online because that's, on, that's what the internet is for, apparently, that uh, well it's not fair, you know, you're, you guys are saying that Dr. Seuss has been canceled and, and the person, look, anytime you make a very declarative statement you better back it up and they said nobody in the country is banning Dr. Seuss. That's not true. There are schools and other places that have just banned it outright. Um, but these are the six in question. I actually have one of them. I was, these are not his better known books but uh, and to think I saw it on Mulberry Street. I actually had, I didn't bring it this morning, but. Um, and I get it, you know, this is the, one of the images that was concerning. Um, and it's about a kid who has an overactive imagination and he just sees a normal cart and uh, being pulled by a horse as he's going down Mulberry Street. Um, but when he wants to tell his dad about it, he decides to exaggerate. So he's a politician in the making um, as he begins to lie. And he, he talks about all sorts of different things that he saw. And you can see in the picture, you know, there's a, a march, a band that's part of the, the procession and all the rest. And, and, and then he says, a Chinaman who eats with sticks. Well, that's really horrible. I mean, this is, I don't think this is terribly uh, inappropriate. And it's the illustration that, you know, um, I guess bothers some folks. Okay. Now, I do get the one from If I Ran the Zoo. Um, these images where uh, Seuss is portraying those two little guys in the front, those are supposed to be African natives. And so they, those pictures probably could be done differently um, because they look a little bit more like monkeys and that's not really appropriate. But rather than ban the book, burn the book, how about sit down with your kids and go online and say, well, here's what Africans really look like and here's their culture and isn't it awesome how God made us all look differently? So that's just my opinion. Um, but, you know, Sneetches is all about that it's what's on the inside that matters. I mean, the whole book is about, you know, it doesn't matter. Uh, something about content of character versus color of skin. Anyway, I don't know who said that, but um, he'll be banned next. Don't, don't think that that's not out of the realm of possibility. Um, if they find out that King was a Republican, uh, they're gonna, and that he was pro-life, they're really going to be annoyed. Oh, ben Franklin. So um, just in the, 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 along the lines of lunacy, um, the House and Senate just passed a $1.9 trillion uh, supposedly COVID relief package. Interesting how a whole lot of it has nothing to do with COVID. It's bailing out states that didn't manage themselves well um, or got a little too handsy, New York. Um, the current population in the United States is a little bit over 330 million, so if you divide that into quickly, somebody do this in your head, it comes to almost 5,800. That's per man, woman, and child. Elena, that is what you owe, so cough it up, sister. <laughs> And obviously there's a lot of folks in the United States that 
can't work, don't work, so that dollar for you guys is way higher. Oh, but it's, so you're gonna get 1,400 for, from the government of your money, and it's gonna cost you six grand plus <laughs> to get it. Something seems inefficient about that. Oh well. Who else should we pick on? Now, I'm not a huge fan of J.K. Rowling. I don't think she's one of the greatest literary wonders of the world. Um, if you don't know who she is, she's the author of the Harry Potter books and, and others. And she got into a lot of trouble um, in the last couple of years by defending, first of all, this individual. It says, I stand with Maya. So Maya is this uh, lady from the United Kingdom that made a terribly hateful and hurtful statement saying that trans women are men. And she was fired. And Rowling put up this comment here, dress however you please. Now look, Rowling's not a Christian, she's not conservative by any means, but common sense is common sense. Dress however you please, call yourself whatever you like, sleep with any consulting adult who'll have you, live your best life in peace and security, but force women out of their jobs for stating that sex is real. And she's talking about sex as in gender. Um, and so she got a lot of backlash over that, and she did double down and say, look, you know, women are women, men are men, why should anybody, why is that hate speech for declaring the truth? Um, and the reason I bring this one up, because this is, like, you can see the, the tweet there is from 2019, uh, so a couple of years ago, but um, is that Warner, uh, Brothers Studio is releasing a new Harry Potter game, and I think they did this kind of as a dig to J.K. Rowling, but uh, when you pick your avatar, you're gonna be allowed to pick a transgender avatar. Um, so, yay. All right, so this is political stuff in a way, and it's, it's culture, but as we've mentioned before, this is creeping into the church, and this is, it's very disturbing. And the reason that we're going through this Christianity 101 series, I think most of us in this room have those beliefs down pretty solid, you know, but sometimes we have questions or we have doubts, and if the church isn't answering these questions, then who's going to answer them? Um, you're certainly not going to get it from most of the media sources that are out there. Um, but it has crept into Christendom, and that is very disturbing. So there is a church, in, uh, actually, this is actually a story I just saw this morning, so I quickly scrambled. Uh, but when we're looking at statements of faith, this is Grace Point Church. This is in uh, Nashville, Tennessee. Their beliefs, I went onto their website, at our core, Grace Point holds to these principles with open hands and humility. One, God is a mystery to be explored, not a doctrine to be espoused. Number two, life is a gift to be enjoyed. Number three, love is a responsibility to be shared. Number four, the good news is that you are inherently united with God. Now, some of that is fine. Life is a gift to be in joyed and love is a responsibility to be shared. But Grace Point further, and this is still available on their Facebook page, so I was doing some scrambling this morning because I don't want to give you guys, guys information if I haven't checked it out. This is on their Facebook page. The Bible isn't the Word of God, self-interpreting, a science book, an answer rule book, inerrant or infallible. The Bible is a product of community. Could you just hold your neighbor's hand right now and... Well, hey, 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 hey. Um, and Norm, that does not qualify as date night, so try again. A product of community, a library of texts, multivocal. Here's, here's just my opinion. If you don't understand a term that somebody's using, it might be because they don't want you to understand that term. Multivocal, I guess different voices is what that means. Uh, a human response to God. The Bible is a human response to God? I thought it was God speaking to us. <laughs> and living and dynamic. Oh, you know what that means. That's the same ideology that people have 
now put on the U.S. Constitution. It's a living, breathing, dynamic document. It changes, it ebbs and it flows. No, it does not. God's word does not ebb and flow. It is what it is because God does not ebb and flow. He is who he is, what he is. Grace Point is part of a, an alliance called Clarif Clarity. Clarity. Church Clarity, excuse me, Church Clarity, is a crowdsourced database of Christian congregations scored by our team of volunteers based on how easy it is to find a church's actively enforced policy online. We currently evaluate church, web, church websites for policies that impact LGBTQ plus people and women in leadership. What? what? That's Hebrew for what? So our church does not have an actively enforced policy. Guess what? We're not going to have one. So I looked up very quickly. I didn't do a lot of work on this because, like I said, I was doing it this morning as I was in the shower. No, that's not completely true, but it does explain why I didn't shave this morning. This is in Everett. I've not heard of Soundview Church before, but they've been verified clear, meaning that they follow, I know it's hard to read, that they, that they adhere to these guidelines on their LGBTQ policy, that they hire them, yes, they will perform the weddings, yes, they will ordain them, yes, and that they are in leadership. That Grace Point Church, their rating, they said, it said that over 50% of their staff and leadership were LGBTQ+. Plus. Um, and similar with their women in leadership policy, preaches, yes, ordains, yes, governance, yes, senior pastor, yes. So I don't know where, Sound anybody had heard of Soundview Church? No? And we've got a few Everett folks, but I haven't heard of it, but um, just pulled that one because it, well, it, because it's local. So look, these things matter. It does matter. Because I've, I've read people uh, online, their re response sometimes, and these are Christians that say, you know, why, why don't we just get all along? Why does this really matter? If you believe something different, that's you. You do your thing. It's because it matters to God. You know, God, if, if there aren't absolutes, then what's the point? I mean, society will just continue to devolve into chaos and anarchy. And we're seeing those policies and beliefs play out um, in our culture. So this morning, we're, we are going to uh, look at the church's statement of faith. We'll continue looking at that. A um, couple of things as we look at the statement of faith. It's, we're not taking a like a super deep look into it. There are doctrines and teachings and policies in the statement of faith that we will circle back to. Um, <laughs> and because we want to emphasize certain points. Um, you know, so we'll get to those in a moment. So before we proceed, uh, let's go ahead and have a moment of silent prayer and then uh, just ask the Lord for his wisdom and guidance. God in heaven, thank you for truth. Thank you that we can rely on your word. We can depend on it. We can, we can bank our lives on it, which is a pretty amazing thing. Lord, we all have doubts. We all have questions from time to time. We may even question you and doubt you. And yet you are gracious. You are long-suffering. You put up with a lot of stuff that as humans we wouldn't put up with, don't put up with. But Lord, you're, there's a limit to what you will put up with. And there's a time when there will be judgment, when there will be discipline for sin that is in the world. And Lord, thank you that the eternal consequence of our sin has been dealt with on the cross through your son, Jesus Christ, his death and resurrection. Thank you, Lord, that it is a free gift. We can't earn it. And thank you that you continue to be ever-present in our lives through your Holy Spirit, through your word. We love you. We praise you in Christ's name. Amen. So we're going to take a look at our plans versus God's. Um, his plans are usually better. Now, this is a pretty familiar passage. Um, we covered some of it a couple of years ago. 
Proverbs chapter 16. So we'll be in two basic texts this morning, Proverbs 16 and Psalm 37, if you are somebody who likes to bookmark things. Proverbs 16, of course, this is Solomon, and in his God-given wisdom is um, basically sharing, you know, wisdom, uh, God's wisdom with, with the world. Verse 1, the plans of the heart belong to man, but the answer of the tongue is from the Lord. So we can plan anything we want to, but ultimately... God is in control. God has the final word. He, also, he has the first word, the second word. He has all of it. <laughs> he has the final word. All the ways, verse 2, of man are pure in his own eyes, but the Lord weighs the spirit. So we can have great ideas. Do they line up with what God, with his truth or not? And then we're given a command to commit our work to the Lord, commit your work to the Lord, and look what happens. Your plans will be established. If your plans are in agreement with God's plans, then they're going to move forward. In fact, this word established is the idea that, I mean, they're, they're on firm, solid footing. Nothing can move God's plan. If God wants to do something, he's going to do it. And God's plan, as we've mentioned before, God does not have a plan B. He has a plan A. Um, and when we deviate from his plan, he will do everything, everything in his love to get us back on track. And he will use discipline. He will swat the holy hoo-hoo out of us to, to get us back on track. He will use pain in our lives to get us on track because he loves us. And we'll get back to Proverbs 16 in a moment. Psalm 37, fret not yourself because of evildoers. I find great comfort in Scripture in general, but in this psalm in particular, because it can be so discouraging to see the lunacy that is going on in the world. And you just scratch your head. It's like, what is going on? Well, we're seeing the result of rebe rebellion. We're seeing rebellion against God, re rebellion against his word, against his truth, his principles. And of course, this is going to be the result. This is not a surprise. I don't think we're surprised that this is the result. I think we're surprised that things are happening that we never thought would happen in our lifetimes and surprised at the rate that things are happening. It's like, wow. Because things have been going down for a while, but it seemed more like a slow decline. Um, and you know, now we're just free falling. We're, we've jumped the cliff. Hopefully there's water below, or pudding, I think would be a much better thing to land in than water. Fret not yourself because of evildoers. Be not envious of wrongdoers. Why? For they will soon fade like grass and wither like the green herb. No progressive Christianity, this is not referring to marijuana, and progressive Christianity, that, that, that church I mentioned, Grace Point, they consider themselves a progressive Christian church. In 2015, they became the largest, quote-unquote, evangelical church to affirm same-sex marriage. So they even made it into Time magazine. And, um, and so they, were, they said, well, we're going to do it because of love, because God loves everybody. And yet you see the result. After six years, now they're posting things about the Bible. Well, you know what? The Bible is just, it's, it's a fluid document. It's dynamic. Uh, do what you want with it. Oh, in fact, you know what? I think I need to go back because I'm pretty sure I had a quote from the pastor, the so-called pastor there. Um, there we go. Josh Scott. Pray for Josh Scott that, that he would listen to the Lord. He said about the Bible, he said, there is stuff in the Bible. Maybe you could have used a different word than stuff. There is stuff in the Bible that I think really goes against the character of God. What? Really? I thought that the Bible was an expression of the character of God. It's God saying, here's who I am, here's who you're not. Deal with it. Aren't you glad I'm not God? 
That should be the loudest amen we've ever heard in this church. Or a woman, for those of you who are... Yeah, right? Fret not yourself because of you, for they will soon fade like the grass and wither like the green herb. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and befriend faithfulness. Befriend, befriend faithfulness. Delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. Now there are folks that are part of the, you know, name it and claim it, blab it and grab it, the health, wealth and prosperity group that look to this verse and say, see, you know what? God will give you the desires of your heart. But we know, because we've studied this before, that is not what that verse is saying. It's saying that your desires become God's desires. He implants his desires in your heart. And you're, again, you're lining up with him, not the other way around. God would not be God, and he would not be a loving God if he gave you everything that you desired. In fact, he would be a hateful, horrible God. But that's not the God that we serve. So, Elena, if your mom gave you everything that you ever wanted, would that be showing you love? The answer is no. <laughs> because what if you asked for something that wasn't good for you, wasn't safe for you, you know, and your mom said, well, you know, I love you, so I'm just going to give it to you. That's not what a good parent does, and it's not what a good God, it's not what a great God does. God is compassionate, and it's out of his compassion, his love, and any, under, any, any other number of attributes we can list off, that he does not give us what we want all the time. Now, sometimes he gives us what we want. I don't know if it's just to shut us up. <laughs> uh, or it's like, okay, I'll give you what you want. Let's see how that ends up. I don't know. But God is only going to give us good things. And our job is to trust in him, to delight ourselves in the Lord. Um, to learn who he is, to study his word, to talk to him through prayer. It continues, verse 5, commit your way to the Lord, trust in him, and he will act. He will bring forth your righteousness as the light and your justice as the noonday. Be still before the Lord and wait patiently for him. Fret not yourself over the one who prospers in his way, over the man who carries out evil devices. Refrain from anger and forsake wrath. Fret not yourself, it tends only to evil. For the evildoer shall be cut off, but those who wait for the Lord shall inherit the land. It's really an amazing passage, and, and I encourage you to read the rest of that psalm. Um, but as we look at God's love and how he's always going to do what's best for us, our job is to remember who he is and to not stress and fret about the idiocy that we're surrounded by, uh, but to, be re to recognize who he is truly. Because here's the problem. Things go well when we remember this statement that he is, I am, he is God, period. Little things make a difference. Little things matter. Compromises matter. Because what have we done in our culture? We've changed it to this. We just changed the G from capital to lowercase, and now I am God turns into I'm God. So I get to choose what I want to do. I get to choose what's right and what's wrong. Your truth is your truth. My truth is my truth. But that's not what God says. Insert goofy thing here. Write your plans in pencil and give God the eraser. God's plans, by the way, not written in pencil, are they? Well, uh, let's take a little bit of a, div a detour into the wonderful world of architecture and engineering. Ooh, I was waiting for that, said Marsha Pitchford. <laughs> I don't know. I'm sorry, you just... You were there. Anybody know who Jack Christensen was? He passed away a few years ago. You might not know who he is, but you know what he did. He was an architect. I'll give you a couple of hints. These are some older pictures. Um, might be hard to tell. This is Seattle. I'll give you a clue. If you look right there, that's King Street Station, the train station. Any idea what that shape? So that's the kingdom. That's the found when they were building the foundation for the kingdom. Um, Here's kind of a cool construction shot of the dome. Um, 
Elena, you were never in the kingdom, were you? That's so sad. Anybody else never been in the kingdom? You haven't been in the kingdom? Betty, I'm so sorry. I would take you there, but it's not there anymore. So Jack Christensen, he was, uh, he's the one who came up with, when the kingdom, by the way, was completed, it was the largest concrete, uh, uh, forget the other term there, but dome in the, in the world as far as that span there. So there he is standing, uh, would any of you stand on the roof? Of the kingdom? No, some of you would, some of you wouldn't. I think it would be kind of cool. Um, now, thankfully, he was not standing when that happened and it was Im <laughs> imploded, but this guy, again, you might not know his name, but you know his work. You know the kingdom. This one's right down the road. We're, uh, if you know where 190th is, this is the pedestrian overpass. Um, here's an older view. This is the only view I could find of kind of what it looks like if you're driving down uh, I-5. Well, this is obviously not taken from somebody driving down I-5. But uh, he, he used concrete in many different ways, and kind of thin-shelled concrete was sort of his thing. Uh, if you're a Spokane resident, uh, this is from the 1974 World Expo. He designed that pavilion. Um, if you've been to the Museum of Flight, he designed the original building, that large building. So we have Jack Christensen, architect, engineer. And then we have this gentleman, another architect, Minoru Yamasaki. Um, you can see him there sitting on the couch. Anybody know who the female is that's standing? You recognize her? It's Dixie Lee Ray, yeah, uh, who was the first female governor in the state of Washington. Uh, so Dixie Lee Ray uh, standing there. Uh, this is, I think, in 69 or something along those lines. You know Yamasaki's work as well. Uh, this is the IBM building, downtown Seattle. You can see Benny Hanna used to be there. Um, and he also, Kitty Corner uh, from that building is Rainier Tower um, on kind of the pedestal building. He designed that. But the buildings that he's most noted for uh, being the architect on were the Twin Towers, the World Trade Center. And you can see the similarities. Um, in fact, if you go back to the IBM, whoops, the IBM building, you can see those vertical lines. Um, the IBM building was actually kind of a prototype um, built before the World Trade Center. So you can, you can see those similar uh, images with the arches. Um, here's a picture at the base of one of the, the towers. Kind of see that arch work and the lines and things of that nature. So we also know him for designing this famous structure, the Pacific Science Center. See those lines again? Very similar. Um, liked those vertical lines. But here's where these two men converge because they both worked on this project. And so uh, Mr. Yamasaki, uh, the original buildings there, uh, that building right there, there's several of them in the Science Center. They were just going to be plain boxes, and they were temporary buildings for the 1962 World's Fair. Yamasaki basically said, and Christian as well, Christensen, but Yamasaki said, I'm not putting my name on just a plain box, so you're going to have to do something. <laughs> so they figured out, how can we do this and do this quickly? Well, Christensen came in and said, hey, we can do these prefab concrete uh, panels, and you can see one of them being raised up. And it stands today, and it's now a, a, is a historical landmark in the city of Seattle. And I mean, just the gracefulness. Yamasaki said he was inspired by cathedrals, and so you can you can see kind of again that those, those arches. This is you know not quite ten years before the World Trade Centers, but you can see those themes. Um, just the gracefulness of these structures. Now, why do I bring this up? Well, because if you know anything about architecture and engineering, details matter. Small things matter. Plans matter. You have to have plans and plans that are solid. And I don't know the spiritual state of either of these gentlemen. They, they both, uh, like I said, Christensen passed away, I think, in 2017, and uh, Yamasaki passed several years before that. Um, thankfully, I think for Yamasaki, he, he died before he saw the towers uh, come down. I think that would have just really broken his heart. Um, but whether they knew the Lord or not, they or even knew that they were doing this, they were 
they were able to do what they were able to do because of God, because of the principles that God has put. He's impressed these things upon our creative minds, and, and some of you are creative. Well, why are you, why are you creative? Because you're a reflection of your creator. And some of you are creative in the art of cooking and baking, and some of you, it's more like a, 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 a sacrifice uh, when you cook dinner. And that doesn't make you a bad person, it just means that's, that's just not where you're gifted. So maybe cooking's not your thing, but you're a wonderful musician, or you like to write, or you do art, or, or you like math. I mean, I've met people that like math. No, it's awesome. And why not love math? Math, where did we get math from? It's from God. God's a mathematician. All of these things that we have, all of these talents are reflections of who our creator is. So we can make all the plans that we want, but if these folks, if these men deviated from biblical principles, from God's principles, these structures would not have stood. And note that they stood for, some of them are still standing. Now the kingdom was, it took them a lot of effort to take that down. They were still using godly principles, if you will, to... Uh, take that structure down. And evil can destroy these things as well that we have built, as we saw on 9-11. So when we go back to Proverbs, we do see that, yeah, um, we can make the plans that we want, but if they don't belong to God, they're not going to go anywhere, anywhere. Why? Continuing in verse 4, the Lord has made everything for its purpose, even the wicked for the day of trouble. Everyone who is arrogant in heart is an abomination to the Lord. Be assured he will not go unpunished. Now, I don't know if you go through this in my, I, I know I struggle with this sometimes because I, I want to put myself in the position of being judge. <laughs> and I want to mete out punishment. Uh, it's like, Lord, I know exactly how that person should be disciplined. And he replies, actually doesn't normally reply to that at all. Um, he ignores me, and that's probably a good thing. But I feel like, okay, God, why do you let these nasty, evil, hateful people, why do you let them continue to live? It serves no purpose. And yet, note what it says in verse 4, the Lord made everything for its purpose, even, it's like he was anticipating our thoughts, our question, hmm, even the wicked for the day of trouble. Everyone who is arrogant in heart is an abomination to the Lord. Note, it says everyone, those who believe in God, those who don't believe God. Arrogance is when I think I know more than God does. And be assured, he will not go unpunished. By steadfast love and faithfulness, iniquity is atoned for. And by the fear of the Lord, one turns away from evil. When a man's ways please the Lord, he makes even his enemies to be at peace with him. Better is a little with righteousness than great revenues with injustice. Huh. The heart of man plans his way, but the Lord establishes his steps. So that's kind of, we'll, that, that portion of Proverbs, we'll, we'll end it there. Again, you can continue on. Um, but it leads to this, you know, Proverbs is quite often in couplets, you know, two statements or two verses that kind of go with each other. And this, the thematically, it seems to be a good point to uh, pause on that particular passage. But the heart of man plans his way, but the Lord establishes his steps. So look, we can plan whatever we want, but our, it is important that we plan in a way that is going to bring glory and honor to God, that is going to follow his truth, his principles, his doctrines. And so we've seen men and women, uh, primarily men when we are talking about the creeds, that have struggled for decades, even centuries, in coming up with these basic principles of what belief is. So we've looked at the Apostles' Creed somewhat, and we've also looked at the Nicene Creed. We talked about how it changed their addition of the Holy Ghost. We'll get to that, or as we call it, the Holy Spirit. Call him the Holy Spirit. But evergreen statement of faith. Now, Anna has a few copies, um, hard copies, if you would like one. I did send it out uh, via email earlier in the week. Um, and actually, I did get a couple of responses, people saying, well, what about this, or if you consider that? 
That is awesome. I welcome that. Uh, so the board is in the process of reviewing the church constitution and reviewing the statement of faith. These are good documents. Um, so we're not looking at massive, you know, overhauls. Uh, the statement of faith was last updated in 2016, so it's it's fairly recent. And that's when we added language that we didn't think we'd ever have to add to a statement of faith. Keep in mind, a statement of faith is not, not supposed to be exhaustive of a church's beliefs. It's just saying, hey, these are the main things that we believe in. These are the non-negotiables. These are the most important things. And so what we added, as you know, in 2016 were statements on, on life and marriage and gender, because uh, those were certainly coming under attack. Um, we'll see if we get that far today. We, we started going through it last week. And like I said, we're going to just kind of summarize things today. Um, and next week is communion, so we probably won't look at it next week. But So it talks about the scriptures, what we believe, and it is important that you guys know our stand. So contrast that to what we saw from Grace Point. We do not believe that the Bible is a dynamic work. <laughs> it is static. It is not going to change. Uh, we believe in the scriptures of the Old and New Testaments as verbally inspired of God and inerrant in the original writing, and we believe they are of supreme and final authority in faith and practice. That last phrase, by, by the way, where it says final authority in faith and practice, you'll find that used in a lot of traditional statements of faith. Um, it's pretty common. The Godhead, another important concept. Um, of the Trinity, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, that these are one God having precisely the same nature, attributes, and perfections. And then it goes through each member of the Trinity. We're not going to go through it today, but we will be, uh, we've gone through God the Father and God the Son uh, when we were looking at the Apostles' Creed. We have not uh, touched upon God the Holy Spirit, and so we will do that in the near future. Because, as I mentioned last week, I think it's a, the Holy Spirit's a bit mus misunderstood. That's one reason you didn't see, it show, see him show up with any detail in the Apostles' Creed and the original Nicene Creed. Because they really, there was belief in him, they just weren't sure who he was and what his role was. And as fairly conservative Protestant Baptists, uh, as far as our uh, beliefs, the Holy Spirit sometimes, I think, is intimidating in that, well, we don't want to come across as being charismatic or Pentecostal, um, so we just avoid it. But why would we avoid the third member of the Trinity? <laughs> if we believe in the third member of the Trinity, then we ought to know who he is and what he does. In fact, our statement of faith, I think, does actually a really good job of summarizing what he does. We believe that he convicts of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. We believe that he is the agent of the new birth and that he seals, indwells, empowers, guides, teaches, witnesses to, sanctifies, comforts, and abides with the believer forever. You know, Jesus spoke of him, uh, that, the, that a comforter, the comforter was going to come. And that's so one of the things that he does is that he does comfort us. So then this is one of the areas that we inserted in 2016. Really, really didn't change the statement of faith as far as what was already there. It's just we felt we had to define some things. And this language, um, I think some of it maybe needs to be tweaked a little bit. Um, because when we put it in, it was from another, another source. It's not bad, but just my opinion. Because ultimately, you guys get to make the decision on what, if anything, gets changed in the statement of faith. God created mankind as two distinct genders. We believe that God created the male and the female as distinctly separate genders, meant to be distinguishable. Since creation, God, by procreation, wonderfully and immutably creates each person as male or female. These, are, these two distinct complementary genders together reflect the image and nature of God. We believe that rejection of one's biological gender is rebellion against God and a rejection of the image of God within that person. I don't know that I'd change that one at all. <laughs> um, 
Any questions or comments? Um, not to get into big, drawn-out debates, but if at this point, if you have some questions or comments, just shoot your hand up, and I'll try to address them. But or if you need clarification. All right. Uh, the second point under there, God established marriage and its intimacy between a man and a woman. We believe the first marriage established by God set the standard of marriage and its intimacy between a male and a female. We believe that the term marriage has only one meaning, the uniting of one man and one woman in a single exclusive union as delineated in scripture. We believe that God intends sexual intimacy to occur only between a man and a woman who are married to each other. Don't have a problem with that one either. Um, now, if you have a problem with it or again, are confused or whatever, please feel free to, like I said, a, a couple folks emailed me and, and uh, they had questions. One person felt that we didn't specifically address the creation and what our views are on creation. And so it's like, okay, well, maybe we need to put that in there. Um, you know, like I said, it's not an exhaustive document. It's not meant to be. But I think it's going to have to become more detailed because we used to speak a common language among Christendom, right? Even if you were, regardless of denomination, we all knew what these terms meant. It's like, oh, okay, there, we knew what this was, and, and we might have disagreements on how we worship or... Um, even like with baptism, you know, is it infant baptism uh, by immersion, sprinkling, you know, whatever. And, and so those are conversations that, that, you know, we would have and there'd be differences among, among churches. But now, I mean, these terms don't necessarily mean the same thing. Um, when you ask people at Grace Point, do you believe that the Bible is, is God's word? I, they might say yes. Um, do you believe in the Bible? They would probably say yes. But when you ask, is it inerrant? And what does inerrant mean? Okay, it means without error. Notice the way that we stated it uh, was inerrant. Trying to go back to, whoop. Um, inerrant in the original writing. And that's key because we believe that these, these men were inspired by God. So through the power of the Holy Spirit, they perfectly put down what God wanted them to put down. We're also recognizing that people are people <laughs> and that people can make mistakes. However, um, in fact, name a translation that doesn't have boo-boos in it. There isn't one that we have available to us today. Um, and yet, the amazing miracle of the Bible do we realize, do we fully appreciate, I know I don't always, do we fully appreciate the miracle that the Bible is? The fact that it is what it is. If you weren't able to make it last week for the um, Patterns of Evidence video on the Moses controversy, I would encourage you to make an effort to, to uh, come tonight. Um, even though you missed part one, you're still going to get a lot out of part, uh, part two. But the fact that God preserved Scripture the way that he did, um, they referenced last week, you know, a recent cave uh, discovered, uh, you know, in Qumran where the Dead Sea Scrolls were uncovered. They haven't found scrolls in there. So I watched a video, um, a part of this uh, organization, and they are talking about, part of it was a pitch, they were asking for support, but I didn't find it heavy handed. But here's why they're, they say things are very urgent. COVID had an impact on their research because they were not allowed to conduct some of the archeological digs because COVID runs rampant in caves of Jordan. Um, mummies were dropping dead left and right. It was terrible, it was horrible. Andrew Cuomo put them in nursing homes, but that was a whole nother thing. So, but here's the thing is that Guess, guess, here's the problem with, oh, Darren's going to get political. Here's the problem with gun control and overregulation, all the rest. Moral, righteous, lawful people follow the laws. Here's a shock. Criminals don't. <laughs> so you can pass all the gun legislation you want, 
wow, that's going to really have an impact on the people who don't follow the laws in the first place. It's going to have zero impact. All right, I'm off the political part. Are we good? All right, thanks. I look to Chris Ashcraft as my moral compass sometimes. <laughs> but guess who didn't follow the, the restrictions on uh, not going out and digging stuff up? Criminals. <laughs> So they've been ransacking these archaeological digs, and so, um, and guess what else has changed? We have a different president in the United States. That has an impact on foreign policy, uh, does it not? <laughs> Uh, and guess what? Israel is going to have some leadership changes. So, you know, some of these areas, they're just not stable uh, for a number of reasons. And so they really feel that they only have about a year or two uh, of that short of a window to kind of get in there. They're, they're able to get back in there and do some more, more digging. But they know that there's other caves that just haven't been uncovered yet. And who knows what might, what, what, what might lie in those. So anyway, oh my goodness, I got off track, didn't I? Why am I here? I just like presidential quotes. That was embarrassing. If you guys watched that, that was embarrassing. Some of you don't know what I'm talking about, and that's OK. Um, where are we at? God in life, we did marriage, sexual immortality, immorality. I knew I was going to do that. Even in my mind, I was saying, and I, I, can, I told my mom, it's like, I'm going to say the wrong word. When I worked in the jail system, I don't know if it was a Freudian slip, but guys would quite, I'd have them read scripture and they'd say, you know, sexual immortality is like, yeah, uh -huh, yeah, you wish. Um, Immorality. We believe that any form of sexual immorality, including adultery, fornication, homosexual behavior, bisexual conduct, bestiality, incest, and use of pornography, is sinful and offensive to God. Now, that one's not changing. Um, did you did you catch that statement that that organization that uh, that I mentioned er, that Grace Point was part of? Clarity, yeah. Where was that? Here it is. We currently evaluate church websites for policies that impact LGBTQ plus people and women in leadership. They're looking for what? Uh, I guess because they're not going to like our statement of faith. And why should it matter to them? We believe differently than they do. It shouldn't matter. Um, and so, you know, they're going to say that we're nasty, hateful people, and some of you are, but <laughs> no, that is not true. All right, so um, I'll just kind of summarize these, but God and life talking about the sanctity of life at, at, in any form, in any stage. Um, notice it says, uh, da, 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 da. human life is of an inestimable, inestimable worth in all its dimensions, including unborn babies, the aged, the aged, the physically or mentally challenged, and every other stage or condition from conception through natural death. We are therefore called to defend, protect, and value human life. Um, that we are created and fallen. Some people don't believe that we are fallen, that we are in, basically, we're, <laughs> we're nasty people by nature, but because of the grace of God and putting our faith and trust in Christ, we do not have to be stuck on the nasty train. Um, it talks about Satan salvation, exactly what that means. It's hard to believe, but salvation has, you know, continued to come under attack, and, and not in ways that would be traditional or that we would think. The unity of believers, which of course is important. The ordinances, we believe in two ordinances here at Evergreen, uh, communion and baptism. Neither of these have anything to do with salvation. Zip. Uh, these have to do with obedience. They are reflections of Christ's work in us. 
and again, the Christians walk in service and what we ought to look like. That we are in the world, but not supposed to be of the world, not living in a sinful state. And the Great Commission, and then it does talk about end times, which is appropriate because we're almost at the end. And we'll get into this too, because there's a lot of changing in, uh, in beliefs. The traditional timeline of end times. So the rapture, some people don't believe that the rapture is a real thing. One of their arguments is, well, the Bible never uses the word rapture. Okay. <laughs> but the concept is certainly there. Um, just like the word dinosaur doesn't appear in scripture. Gee, I don't know, why would that be? Oh, because it was created by a British dude. He was a dude, right? Um, in the 1800s, he coined the, you know, the term dinosaur. So, of course, it's not going to appear in the Bible. Um, but the rapture. We are in, I'll ask you a quiz. Pre-trib, mid-trib, post-trib. So the idea is, when does Jesus come back? Um, we believe we're currently in what many call the church age, and that it ends you know, the one belief is that it ends with the rapture. So next event is that Jesus returns. Um, and then there's the tribulation, the millennium. So you can see the arrows there. Pre-trib means you believe that Jesus is going to come back before the tribulation. Believers go with him. Um, the tribulation, the seven-year period there. Some believe he comes in the middle, three and a half years into it. Um, and the others believe in the post-trib view that he comes after the tribulation. What does this church believe? Pre-trib, are we correct? Yes. Of course we're correct. <laughs> we're, we're Baptists. We don't make mistakes. Actually, we, we have Baptist on the name. We, we hold to many and most Baptist teaching, but I'm, I'm a Christian first, and who cares second? Um, there's this pre-gap theory for the rapture uh, I saw on a dude's website. Lots of dudes, not the same dinosaur dude. But he believes there's a gap, um, and he gets into that, and he, he said, oh, I know this is earth-shattering. Nobody's ever heard this before. Uh-huh. No, somebody's, somebody's made it up. So anyway, that's what we see there. The last view, and then we will have to wrap things up, the thing that's covered is the eternal state. In other words, heaven and hell. That one's really coming under fire pun intended, in these last days, as far as, you know, what is heaven and hell? This is from a LifeWay research study. 67% uh, of Americans believe that hell is a real place, but 45 believe that there are many ways to heaven. Notice, um, now evangelicals, that's the group that we would fall under, 90% believe is, it's a real place. What to me is disturbing is that 19% believe that there's more than one way to heaven out of evangelical Christians. Now, mainline Protestants, that's, uh, that's not a surprise, but it's really disturbing that only 67% believe that heaven is a real place. Um, notice uh, black Protestants line up on a lot of things with evangelicals, and I think that's important to remember, that the black church is very conservative when it comes to um, their teaching, but they vote more liberal. Why is that? Well, I think they've been deceived, like a lot of us have been deceived. And I think Donald Trump, uh, for whatever you think of him, when he said, what do you have to lose? <laughs> Some of them was like, hey, yeah, <laughs> what do we have to lose? And then you have several amazing individuals uh, from, uh, let's see if I can butcher their names, like Lawrence Jones, Candace Owens, uh, Carol Swain, I love her. Um, these individuals who are black, conservative, Christian, and, and there's many more of them coming to the forefront, and, and the people are beginning to change their, their, their minds. So um, anyway, all right. Oh, I've pressed the wrong thing. I do this all the time. No, I don't. I did it last week. So heaven or hell. Here's the basic views. Traditionalism, which is what we believe, the saved, those who believe in Jesus Christ is our Lord and Savior, go spend eternity in heaven. Those who are unsaved, um, well, they spend eternity in hell, a real hell. Universalism or ultimate reconciliation believes that, well, everybody's saved in the end. Eventually, everybody makes it. 
conditionalism or conditional immorality. The saved go to heaven, but the unsaved are annihilated. They cease to exist. And that's becoming a more and more popular view. Purgatory, uh, the saved go to heaven, maybe. Uh, that's the kind of the Roman Catholic view. Metaphorical, hell is here on earth. Um, Auburn is proof of that. <laughs> that. That this is it. This is the only thing that we get. It's even some of those believe that heaven is metaphorical as well, that there is nothing, nothing after this. Um, all right, sorry. Uh, there, I did again. I hit escape. Don't hit escape. I have issues. All right, so the, the bottom line, ladies and gentlemen, is that God's word is true. God's word is immovable. It is reliable. And these little details do matter. Why are we covering them? Because they're important. It is important whether we believe in heaven or hell. It is important uh, what we believe about Jesus Christ, that we hold to his deity, that he is God. These things are important, and they're going to become more important uh, as we get challenged from all different directions in our culture, in our government, in our own families. We're going to get challenged on these things, and we're commanded to have an answer. Now, your answer may be, I'm not sure. Let me look into that. That's okay. But then look into it. Um, and our job as a church, part of it is to make sure that we're being trained, that we're being taught, that we know what God's word has to say. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for who you are. Thank you that your truth, it's, it's not a mystery to us, Lord. You have spelled it out in your word, and all of us can grasp basic principles. Uh, the fact that you're immutable, that you do not change, is such an important thing to know because, as Scripture says, you are the same yesterday, today, and forever. We know that that means that you love us the same today as you did yesterday and that you will tomorrow. And it doesn't give us an excuse to sin or license to do whatever we want. What it does is gives us license to follow you and let your desires become our desires. Thank you for your love expressed through your son, Jesus Christ. It's in his name we pray these things. Amen.